Uh, hello, I'm Jason Smith. I work at Container Solutions, uh, senior engineer there. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I don't really use Twitter that much, aside from retweeting other people's stuff. I don't really feel like I have anything that important to say. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about binary protocols. Um, but before I get into what you probably came here to see, I'm going to start a little earlier at the beginning. Uh, we're going to go back to 1844. So in 1844, the telegraph was released. Uh, the, it became incredibly popular. Uh, the lines spread all over the world. And on those lines, uh, there was an encoding. Uh, we're all familiar with it, Morse code. Uh, and Morse code is described as a series of dits and dots, or some people call them dots and dashes. And, but it's a, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, Morse code is actually binary. Uh, it's broken down by a time unit, uh, which is a bit. And each dit, da, gap, everything else is, uh, is actually equatable to a binary value. Dits being uh, a 1 plus the 0, it actually has to be defined by the gap following it. Uh, just follow along. Some of you people look a little confused. Uh, so uh, that means uh, telegraphy was the first binary protocol on the wire. It was actually the first time we were transferring data on the wire with binary data. Uh, so is this the first network engineer? Uh, not particularly in this case. That gentleman was actually cutting the wire. Uh, this was taken during the Civil War, and he was cutting the wire trying to hide the, uh, the network from the network partition. <laughs> so uh, is that all we have to learn from Morse code? Uh, not exactly. So Morse was thinking ahead. Uh, if you notice, some of these letters uh, have shorter notation than other ones, such as E, I, S, T, N. He was actually, he chose those because he felt like those were some of the more common uh, letters used when communicating. And uh, it, was, it was, so what he wanted to do is he wanted to make them have the shortest notation. He wanted the actual message being sent on the wire to be as short as possible. He was being frugal with the number of time units. Uh, he wanted to make, like I said, he wanted to make the message as small as possible. So there's actually a name for this. This is called entropy encoding. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Huffman encoding. It uses the same principle. Uh, and the idea behind Huffman encoding, or I'm sorry, entropy encoding, is that you take um, the most common occurring symbols and you assign them the smallest values when you're transferring that message. Uh, so this is, so Morse code wasn't only the first time that uh, we sent binary data on a wire, but it was actually the first time we encoded data for the smallest footprint on the wire as possible. So that was the history lesson for today. Uh, so, it, also, nothing, nothing we're doing is really new. I mean, it's, we've been kind of dealing with the same problems for a long time. So we're going to cover three things today. Uh, first is how we got to where we're at right now, where we're discussing binary protocols. Uh, how bina binary protocols work. And uh, why are we adopting them at this time. So, and hopefully, if you're going to walk away with anything out of this, uh, if you already know this information, you're probably going to walk away with a sense of smug satisfaction. And if you don't, hopefully it'll help you think about what it means to be writing microservices in a cloud-native environment. Um, so let's start by looking on how we got here. So to start, uh, we're going to fast forward to from 1844 to the 1960s. In the 1960s, Pretty much all the way through the 1990s, RPC became pretty much the dominant form of inter-service communication uh, for uh, a distributed system. But it had problems. Uh, we had stubbing, coupling, complexity, and uh, uh, it, it wasn't very portable across a lot of different languages. Uh, and most, in most cases, though, it was using binary data to communicate. Uh, one of the bigger problems with RPC, though, is, is it had this idea that uh, the network was supposed to be transparent to the developer, meaning that they weren't supposed to be aware that you were communicating over a network. Right now, we know that's just not true. Um, we need to know that we're working on a network. Um, 
But aside from all this, uh, even with all these caveats, RPC is still widely used today in distributed systems. So then in the 90s, we got HTTP. And uh, it was, it's been widely adopted. It's, it, it's adopted because it's open and it's easy to tool for. And there's a robust number of tools. Lots of languages can write um, uh, uh, interfaces for it. So, and it, that made it easily multilingual. But it led to what we have, uh, what we're commonly seeing today is data in text. And the first popular one being XML. Uh, the problem with XML is, of course, it's large, it's really, really complicated, it's hard to read, and uh, it led to really big data packages. Uh, two of the most popular uh, uh, communication systems with us were XML and then uh, followed by uh, SOAP. So next we had uh, JSON, Populi pop probably the most popular um, serialization format we have. Uh, it's widely used in REST. Uh, it's, but it has problems. It's not type safe. Uh, the server, server client contracts have just recently become popular. API Blueprint, Swagger, things like that. Only recently have they started to be adopted. Um, and it was still text, so it was slow to deserialize. But both HTTP with the text formats has led to what we commonly refer to today as web services. Uh, it's a lot. It's it's. It's, uh, it's how a lot of companies are now communicating internally, but also externally as well. So that's a little history on how we got there. Um, now I'm going to go into a little bit on how they work. I'm just going to go a general overview and try to get a, a concept of uh, how they're trying to reduce the message, uh, message size by using binary formats. So. <clears throat> They try to achieve one thing. They try to try to make things fast. They're trying to make uh, make it fast in three different ways. In one way is they try to make these messages small, uh, so they <laughs> transfer over the wire quickly. Um, they also try to make decoding and encoding faster, meaning uh, at the expense of being small, they may encode the values, but uh, they're going to try it. And, but some of them don't, and they try to s save it as uh, raw values that you can actually map into memory. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and another way they try to make it fast is if you have big data packages, they try to make it fast by being able to traverse the message quickly. So I'm going to cover three uh, primary ones, protocol buffers, flat buffers, and cap and proto. So all three utilize an inter uh, interface definition. Uh, all of them support the idea of an involving uh, message, meaning you can add and remove fields from it. Uh, they are all strongly typed. They all offer a reflection API, and they all offer text output for debugging in the future. So protocol buffers was developed at Google. Um, if anybody attended the gRPC, you may, uh, may have heard something about it. Uh, it's developed for compact messages. Uh, traversal is done by stepping and skipping, depending on the type of field that you have. Uh, there is some decoding that has to take, has to take place to, uh, to produce usable values. And uh, not all values need to be read, but the entire message needs to be made, read. Because uh, protocol buffers supports duplicate values, meaning uh, if you have uh, the same uh, field twice in the same message, it either concatenates it if it's a string, it adds them together if, uh, if it's an integer. Um, and it, so that means it's required to read the entire message before you can just move on to your, to your work that you're working on. Uh, so when you're looking at, pro, uh, so I'm going to look at how to decode protocol buffers. Uh, it's really simple format. It just starts with a, uh, when you first enter the message, it starts with a field label, a field type. Um, then, uh, uh, oh yeah, and then uh, any ancillary data that may go along with it. Um, some fields have more information that needs to be uh, attached to it, and then the data itself. So as an example, uh, if we're looking at a string, a string is going to start with the label, then the type, which is a string, then the length of the string, and in this case, uh, it would be uh, uh, 
a series of UTF-8 characters. If we're looking at a variable integer, uh, they work a little different, same, but it starts the same exact way. Uh, it's a label, uh, the type, which is var integer, and then the bytes that follow it. Now, with a variable integer, uh, they do encode it in a certain way, but the, the way they delineate the end of the field is by the last byte in the data is going to have the first, the most significant bit will have a zero. That means you know you've reached the end of your data, which means if you're tra traversing the field, you need to read each byte until you hit that one, and then you know you've gotten the, the whole of the data for that field. So <clears throat> that kind of makes protocol buffers uh, uh, at the root level, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up here a second. Uh, so using the length of the word and the length of the variable integer, and by skipping over these bytes, you can actually tell where one field begins and then you assume the next field, uh, or one field ends and you assume where the next one begins. And this sort of stacks the, uh, the fields on top of each other. They're completely independent. They don't know about each other. And you can, in theory, append more bytes of data to the end of your message and that will be continue to be read. And in this case, uh, order is not required either. So now I'm going to talk about flat buffers and Captain Proto together. And then I'm going to uh, tell about, talk about some of the differences and some of the decoding processes. So uh, flat buffers was also developed internal by Google. And Captain Proto was developed by Kent Varda, who is a former developer for Protopub at Google. So they both use zero copy, meaning that the values come straight out of your message, straight into memory, and there is no decoding process involved. Uh, they also use a, a root and hierarchical table structures that define how to access the data. So in, versus protocol buffers where you actually had type and labels, um, uh, flat buffers and cap proto actually have a table that defines how to go into your data. And they both require a root table as well. And you can also use mmap to do memory mapping of your values straight into, into memory. So the key differences between these are, uh, so flat buffers uses indirection. It uses uh, two tables, actually, to define how to access the table. One is the, the V table, and the other one is uh, another table that defines how to actually access the data in the table. Um, but, uh, and, and Cap'n Proto uses 64-bit words, uh, and it bounds the data in these 64-bit words. And s using these two methods, uh, flat buffers actually has to be built from the bottom up, meaning you have to get your, your leaves. If you're building a tree, you have to get your leaves before you get to the root. Cap'n Proto gets built from the root down to the leaves. So I'm going to look at decoding Cap'n Proto really quick. So with Cap'n Proto, the first 64 bits in a message uh, define the root table pointer. And it is defined as, and as you're entering these first uh, 64 bits, you get the type, uh, where is the, uh, the data, the data length, and the pointer's length. So in this example, you, have a, uh, you get the type, which is a structure pointer, which is going to be your first couple bits. It's gonna, always going to be a structure pointer. You're going to get the word offset of how many words over are you going to be uh, uh, traversing before you get to your words of data. And uh, you're also going to get the how many words of data you're getting in there. And then you're going to get more pointers, which would just be repeats of this. And this would create your hierarchical structure. So looking at those words of data, uh, going back to this, your words of data in cell three and four, the words of data uh, uh, are, are, in, are in order and they're based on the spec, meaning that uh, if you give it a value of one and then the next field has a value of two, they have to remain in that order in these words of data. Um, if you add more fields, they can only be added with a higher field value than the previous values have already assigned, and you'll see why that is in a, in a second. So in this definition for Cap'n Proto, we have a Boolean, and then we have a, 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 an integer with eight bits. So in this case, uh, 
if we were to go back to these words of data, uh, and the first word of data, when you first enter that word of data with just this definition, your first bit you'd know would be a Boolean, and then the following eight bits would be the next field. And every field is defined, uh, has a set definition, eight bits, 64 bits, or you know, whatever the type of field it is. And then everything else after that is padded with 64 bits because Cap'n Proto requires everything to be bound into 64 bits. So flat buffers, which is really complicated, and I don't think I could explain it in, uh, in any reasonable amount of time here, but uh, it's, it actually uses uh, label, uh, tables of indirection. So as you can see on the top of the screen where you see the 12, that's actually where you enter your message. It defines the V table. The V table defines then the uh, root tables and the fields, and then the fields jump back and forth, and then you finally get your data. I don't think I could really get through this whole thing in just 30 minutes. Uh, but if you want to, uh, this is, uh, there's an article called Flat Buffers Explained. If you Google that, it's by Maxime Zacks. That's actually his graphic. Uh, he goes into great detail on how this works, and he gives examples. So flat buffers in Cap'n Proto are, uh, they're a tree structure. Uh, they require a root data uh, that gets traversed into lower branches. Now, where this helps is if you have big data structures you, and you only need sections of your data, it makes traversal very quick. You can go deep into large data sets and get data quick, whereas protobuf, you have to traverse your entire message and read each and every field before you actually get the data that you need. Um, but this also comes at the cost of more padding. Uh, you're going to get bigger messages because you're padding your data. Uh, there's a lot more options. Um, I can't really cover all of them. Uh, I chose the three that I did because they're the most popular. Um, and it, it's more, I really wanted to just give an example and just get people to think more about how binary protocols are being encoded so they can get a better understanding of how it all works. So you may be thinking I'm going to talk about benchmarks right now, but uh, that is definitely not the case. Uh, I, I don't really think it's about benchmarks. I think you should evaluate uh, any sort of binary protocol based on what your needs are. Uh, if, like I said, if you're using something with big data sets, flat buffers or Cap'n Proto may be better for you. Um, whereas if you're doing inter-service communication at small um, packages of data, uh, protobus might be your better choice. But it's all about the tooling. Uh, I don't advocate taking any of these without using the, uh, the tools, the ones with the best tooling around them. I, I have to say flat buffers and Cap'n Proto and uh, protobuf all have robust tooling built around them. Um, I can't speak for some of the others. I'm pretty sure Thrift has some pretty uh, robust tooling built around it too. But I'm always an advocate for Choose the ones that have the best tooling and make it the most boring choice you can make because you're going to have a lot more problems anyway. <clears throat> so why are we adopting binary protocols now? Um, why is it a thing? Why are we talking about it now? Why is it, uh, uh, why is it, it, it it's, it's raised its head again from the days gone by? So to get, a, get an idea of why that is, we have to go back to RPC. Uh, it had its drawbacks, uh, but we're seeing a resurgence, but it's not the same RPC. Unlike the old RPC, uh, systems like gRPC uh, do not hide the network. You're completely aware you're working over a network. Uh, it also is well-defined, and it's open, and it's widely available across languages. And I'm sure they're trying to port it to more and more languages every day. And we have to come to terms with the fact that microservices are not web services, which means we don't want to write our services as web services anymore. Um, we need to be w writing our services to, uh, to handle, to, to be as minimal as possible. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the sock shop. Uh, it's, a, it's an open source project uh, sponsored by Weave. Um, so it, it, it's only basically made up of about 10 services. 
But this is all the other traffic that is required to get it, uh, that, is, that is happening in the background. So it's not just the sock shop. You also have Kubernetes traffic. You also have Prometheus traffic. Uh, you also have open tracing going on. And you can see this isn't uh, just making a request to FedEx to figure out how much a shipping cost is for a product you want to ship. This is constant, um, persistent communication going over the network. Uh, by the way, this is uh, Weaveworks. They got a booth upstairs. If you haven't checked out their product, it's amazing. <coughs> so the reason we're doing this is we're trying to shrink our footprint. Uh, we want to shrink it on the network. We want to shrink it in the CPU. And we want to shrink it in memory. Uh, and binary, binary protocols helps us on all three fronts. So. Uh, uh, I was actually surprised by how many Americans are actually at this conference. But uh, in 1992, uh, there was a, a campaign manager for Bill Clinton. Uh, and he uh, famously said, the economy is stupid. And uh, this is James Carville. I love this statement. Um, I, I think it's, it, it cuts right to the issue. It got Clinton elected twice in a row. Uh, but it, it, he, he doesn't mince words. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't beat around the bush. And so for us, I think it's, it's, it's cloud native. Stupid. Um, but that's, that's my boss. He's sitting in the back there, Jamie Dobson. <laughs> uh, he's also speaking next at this event. Uh, but uh, no one at Container Solutions thinks anybody in the room is stupid. And if you have any interaction with Jamie and Penny, my other boss, um, this is pretty much our office dynamic. Um, <laughs> So the point is, we're trying to move to be cloud native. Uh, in that, we are trying to reduce our service footprint. Uh, so we stop thinking about using uh, APIs and web services and things like that. And uh, we have to think about being more economical and productive forms of inter service communication. And that is primarily why binary protocols has become the hot topic of conversation at this point in time. Uh, so, that's my presentation. Thanks. Do I have any questions? Yeah. What are the implications for streaming? As you said, like, what about has to be evaluated as a whole? You mean uh, streaming? So I, I need chunks of data, uh, and I want to process them in the consuming service. Right. Uh, what is what is the implications? I couldn't say what the implications. I haven't thought about it. But um, so streaming uh, on the level of like say gRPC. So it's right. So it's got it's got two it's got two effects there. Um, if you are using a buffered channel, you know, and just reading it off the channel, it does make it faster in the fact that you can just skip over bytes of data, um, but you have to finish your whole consumption. Um, aside from that, uh, but you, so, so it's, it's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword there, I guess. So all three that I showed, um, they all do provide tooling to actually do text output. Um, it's usually based on the actual message package, like you do decode the whole message package. So if you write it to a file, then you will decode it. Um, uh, like I don't think gRPC pr provides the tooling to actually uh, decode from within your code there. But if you were to write your, uh, your, message pa your, your entire message to a file, I, I think you can decode it, all of them from into text format, which makes it a little easier. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, um, so GRPC does provide tooling for that. Who? GRPC, GRPC does provide tooling. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay. I, did, I was not aware of that. I take it the um, you know, platform independent, there's some standard about you know, engine and stuff like that. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, I think. Uh, Captain Proto, I'm pretty sure, is Little Indian. Um, uh, 
protobuf uses var integer, which is an encode, encoded um, integers, and they it's they it's little endian, but uh, they break it into bytes. So and then they it's it's like this. That's your that's your integer. They take it, break it up, put it like this, and then they put the zero at the end. And then when you decode it, you got to put it back over here like this. So. <laughs> Uh, I am not familiar with ASM1, but I think Anne is. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so when you have a protocol buffer message, like the definition of the message, uh, that's actually a protocol buffer message itself, like description. A definition of the message. So when you have like a dot protocol. Right. Uh, that's like the definition. It's, uh, it's a protocol buffer message itself. It's like so called descriptor. I, I, don't, I don't think protocol buffers works like that. How does the what? The self descriptive protocol. So the thing is, you have a service running, and right, you have a, you have an idea. Don't throw a definition. Right. And when you have a service that wants to send you, like, what's the protocol buffer? Uh, like, how does the dot profile look like? It doesn't send you the textual description of the dot profile, but it sends you a so-called descriptor, As which is a protocol buffer message itself. As far as I know, it doesn't send you a descriptor. As far as I know, it sends you, as soon as you start entering the message, the first thing you look at is the label and then the type. Oh, yeah, sure. So no. that's, uh, oh, yeah, anyway, we can stop it. OK, OK. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, I'm Jason. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope you learned something. <laughs>